Okay, it is two o'clock on my clock, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining us today for our webinar on underutilized native wildflowers and plants with ornamental potential. My name is Stacy Matrazo. I'm the executive director of the Florida Wildflower Foundation. And uh, for those of you not familiar with our organization, our mission is to protect, connect, and expand native wildflower habitats through our education, research, planting, and conservation programs. And our work is made possible primarily through the sale and renewal of the Florida State Wildflower License Plate. You see here our old look, we have a new look now. Um, whether you have the old look or the new look, you are supporting our programs and we thank you. Um, with that license plate, you're also eligible for a membership with the organization. You just need to let us know that you have the plate and we'll get you set up in our database. Um, so the funds from the plate, as well as donations and memberships, allow us to support and create projects that build awareness and knowledge of native wildflowers and plants throughout Florida. And we'd like to encourage those of you who find our programs valuable to consider becoming a member, making a donation, or purchasing the state wildflower license plate. Be sure to, um, to check out our website. We have resources on planting and growing wildflowers. Um, you can learn more about where to see wildflowers in bloom, learn what upcoming events we have and more. We're also on social media. You can find us on most platforms at FLA Wildflowers. Um, our next webinar is on May 18th. Sarah Weaver, a PhD candidate with the University of Florida's Entomology and Nematology Department will uh, talk about native bees, their biology, identification, and conservation. And then on June 22nd, we will be celebrating National Pollinator Week with a presentation on how to create a pollinator pot. Um, we also have monthly field trips. Our next one is our annual trip to a wildflower farm in Alachua. So again, you can um, sign up for all of these on our website. Um, I have just a couple of housekeeping items to go over. Before we get started, all attendees are muted with cameras off. Um, the webinar is being recorded. It will be available uh, on our YouTube channel and on our website in 24 to 48 hours. Uh, we'll also send you a link to the recording once it's available. If you have questions during the presentation, please use the Q&A feature. You can enter your questions at any point, and we will address the questions at the end of the talk as time permits. If your question is not answered, um, feel free to email it to info at flawildflowers.org and we will do our best to get you an answer. And now, uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speaker. Dr. Sandy Wilson is a professor in the Department of Environmental Horticulture at the University of Florida. She completed her BS and MS degrees uh, at the University of Delaware, her PhD from Clemson University, and conducted postdoctoral studies at Clemson and Ch Chiba, Chiba University in Japan. Her research focuses on native plant propagation and production, as well as evaluation of invasive ornamental plants. Complementary to that, she teaches courses in native plant propagation, native landscaping, and annual and perennial gardening. Throughout her career, she has been recognized with many awards, including the UF Undergraduate Teacher of the Year Award, the UF Roach Professorship Award, and from the American Society of Horticultural Science, the Outstanding Educator, Undergraduate Educator Award, and the Outstanding Graduate Educator Award. She also holds the distinction of fellow with the International Plant Propagators Society, uh, American Society for Horticultural Science and North American Colleges in Teaching of Agriculture. And in 2018, she co-authored the World Standard Textbook, Hartman and Kester's Plant Propagation, Principles and Practices, Ninth Edition. Today, she is actively working on a new book project focused on the propagation of native plants for landscapes and gardens in Florida. We are so honored to have her here today to talk about an underutilized native plants. Uh, and with that, I will um, stop sharing my screen and hand it over to you, Sandy. Well, thank you, Stacy, so much for that nice introduction. I hope everyone's able to see my screen, okay? 
And, Not yet. Uh, your, your screen hasn't come up yet. Okay, just one moment. So let me share my screen here. Okay, here we go. Just one moment. And There we go. That should be, that should be, does that look? Yep. Perfect. Okay. Great. Welcome everyone. I am so pleased to see the large attendance we have for this hour we get to spend together. The last two days I was at a conference from the University of Florida Center for Landscape Use Efficiency and all of the talks were related to sustainable landscapes and gardens. So um, this is just a perfect segue from that where I can extend some of the research we've been working on over the years um, and share it with all of you. So thank you for inviting me to do this, Stacy. So today we're gonna to be talking about increasing our native palette by propagation. And this is a critical issue because only um, of all of our ornamental sales, only 16% of those sales are represented by native plants. So we're gonna be talking about some of the barriers that uh, we have in seed and cutting propagation, how we can overcome seed dormancy, which is just when seeds don't germinate um, even under permissible conditions, how we can optimize the rooting of cuttings and different aspects that we uh, encounter with container production, and then also the component of field trialing, which is necessary for any new ornamental plant introduction. We are so fortunate in Florida to have this wealth of resources all of these are native, um, are native references. They focus on different aspects, but, um, but most of them are specific to Florida. And we have all of this at our fingertips, which is an indicator that, we, that there is a lot of interest and demand for native plants. We also have some really nice web plant selectors. Uh, this one that I'm showing here is our Florida Friendly Landscaping plant selector, which is now free to everyone. And, um, and you can select the different criteria that you have for, uh, to put a plant in your landscape. And then there's a filter that allows you to select native or not native. And um, so you can build an entirely native landscape using that. And there are also some, some uh, several others that I find of use. But what is lacking, what we don't really have is a reference book for how to propagate native plants in Florida. So these are some textbooks that we have that focus on propagation but they're not specific to Florida. Uh, some of them are more for Texas and the Southwest. Others are for more temperate species. And some are just um, practical guides that are released from local native plant chapters. We do have a central repository called Ranger that is a propagation protocol database where you can search the species you're looking for and see if anyone has entered propagation knowledge. But this primarily focuses on restoration species and many of these are not specific to Florida either. So, um, so our research really over the last 20 years has focused on increasing our native plant palette by propagation and really focusing on natives that have ornamental value or potential, but are not readily available. So we can offer more choices for a diverse landscape and um, have that year round performance that we're looking for and also function through their ecosystem services. 
it, it, it's just, it, it just continues to amaze me that 26% of all of the native flora that we have available from nurseries, only 26% is um, of all of our native plants and natural areas is available through, um, through nurseries. So that leaves a very wide margin for research on identifying species in their natural areas and then figuring out the propagation systems and whether or not they might make a good plant for our landscapes. So in our research, um, this map shows 26 or so different areas where the fir our first step is always to collect, um, to, to um, obtain permits and then collect the seeds from natural, from natural sources. And, um, and then a big component of our research is then trialing them at the different research and education centers in Florida. So this just gives you an overview of the breadth of the collection zones that we work with. This is a, just to give you an example, this is a former student of mine, Carly Steppe, and she was working on two different native wildflowers, Baldwina and Gustafolia, which is called honeycomb, and also Paranechia erecta, which is called square flower. And we think these two plants are just exceptional in the landscape, but, um, but the propagation systems haven't been uh, deciphered and we really don't have that exact propagation scheduling that we need to see this in the commercial marketplace. So this was her uh, master's research. So what I wanted to do in the next few slides is just kind of walk you through some of the wildflowers we've been working on. And um, so the picture on the left uh, shows the species and then a close up of what the seed look like and then uh, what the plant looks like in its, in its natural form. And then a close up of the flower so you can get an idea of why we think it's ornamentally um, of interest. And then also where it's located naturally in Florida. So any of the green counties would, will indicate counties where we have uh, vouchered specimens and it gives us an idea of where you might find it naturally in Florida, which could give you an idea of where it might grow in Florida. So, um, the, um, so for the first plant is Baldwina and Gustafolia. You can see it has a blue, beautiful yellow flower. Uh, below that is Calicia ornata that has a nice um, three petaled flower, uh, purple flower that's very beautiful. Uh, these are all great pollinator plants. Uh, we've looked at Chrysoma and Chrysopsis, these are panhandle species, but we wanted to see how they would do in different parts of Florida. We've also looked at uh, Dahlia feii, which um, is summer, um, phase summer plant. And um, this kind of has a scattered distribution in Florida. Um, and then even some more common species that you might find available at nurseries like the gopher apple or geobalanus oblongifolius, but maybe um, very few nurseries are carrying it. So this is a great species that has wide natural distribution, but is still not widely grown in the nursery. And um, we also looked at Paranechia erecta, which I um, formally introduced you to, Crocanthemum arenocola, and Heliotropium curasavicum, all wonderful species that have different um, ornamental and ecosystem value. And then we looked at several of the polygonum, which used to be um, po polygonella, and now it was changed to polygonum. And um, the wire, the wire weeds, they're called. And um, we had a graduate student working on this for several years as well. So when we start 
when when we identify a plant in a natural areas so or sometimes someone identifies it for us and um, we bring it into the lab and begin to research it the first question that we have to ask ourselves is you know what is going to be the best way to propagate this species year round and um, and for it to be efficient and also to maximize its potential for uh, commercial production. Some questions that we're always struggling with is, when are we gonna collect these seeds or cuttings? How long can the seeds be stored, if, if at all? And um, what is the initial viability or um, how, when we collect the seeds, how many of them have the potential to germinate? And um, if they will not germinate readily, then how can we overcome this? What tests can we do to, um, to increase their germination? And sometimes we just, um, we just don't have great luck with the seeds, in which case we'll turn to vegetative propagation and we want to maximize that optimal rooting condition. And for all of these, we look at container production. It's a, a component that is very under-researched and also landscape evaluation. So these are some pictures of some different graduate students that we've had over the years looking at many of the different species. And while we always try to start with seeds so that we can have that genetic diversity, um, there can be some disadvantages to seed propagation, particularly if the germination is erratic or if it occurs over a very long time. And um, so we start with seed propagation. That's the very first thing we start with. So with seed propagation, there are so many things to consider that you might not realize. And one of the things that I, I really hope that I can emphasize in this talk with examples is how important your initial stock plant quality is when you collect those seeds. So uh, research has shown that the quality of the stock plants, which are just the donor plants, they're the plants that you're collecting the seeds or cuttings from, it directly relates to the quality of your propagules and your propagation success. So if you start with um, populations that are scarce, that only have one or two different plants, or populations that are not healthy, if they look chlorotic, if they're just not in their prime, that's gonna affect, that's gonna compromise your results um, straight away. And um, some other things that, um, that are tricky really with all these species is exactly when the best time to collect the seeds is. Sometimes it's when the seeds, when the fruit turns color, sometimes you have to collect the seeds before then. And sometimes you have to collect the seeds when they're just about to dehiss if it's a species that does that. And um, one of the things we're always battling with is something that happens in, in nature is in that we call this primary dormancy. And all this is, is that when seeds will not germinate, even when we supply them with all the environmental conditions with the water and the appropriate temperature that would be permissive for germination, but they still just aren't ready to germinate. So we look at things like percent germination, how fast that germination is, how uniform it is, and um, the environment that that happens under. And then also what are the components of the media in this container that you see here? You now, what is that? Is that mostly peat, bark, perlite, vermiculite, and does it matter? So I just want to kind of run you through some, a, a typical, if we get a typical unknown bag of seeds, uh, this is where we begin. So we'll, we start with doing something in the lab that's called a pre-germination viability test. And what that does is it treats the seeds, we, we cut the seeds, and then we treat them with this chemical that's called tetrazoleum. 
And then the seeds that are respiring will turn a uh, pinkish color, which is an indicator to us that the seeds are alive to begin with. Because for some species, um, 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 either a majority or sometimes a minority of the seeds just do not have full embryos to begin with, which uh, will compromise their germination potential. So we do that in the lab and it gives us an idea of what's the maximum germination we should be striving to reach. The other thing that we do in our studies is we want to see will these seeds best germinate under, this, under simulated spring, winter, fall, or uh, summer conditions. And that varies by species. And, um, and so we're able to get a good idea of what to expect as far as their temperature response. And we usually do these studies for four weeks. At the end of four weeks, if, we, if they haven't germinated, then we know there's um, a primary dormancy that needs to be overcome. Finally, after all of that, we'll do the same test that we did to see if the seeds are viable. We'll do that again and we'll see if the seeds are still viable, the, the seeds that have not germinated, we'll see if they're still viable. And that's just called a post-germination TZ test. So um, I just wanted to show you this picture. So this is what you'd be looking for if you were staining the seeds with tetrazoleum. A portion of the seed will turn pink and we know that that seed then is viable. Um, this shows in this picture, these are actually a native wildflower that's um, native to, to uh, Tennessee actually. And um, you can see it's little radical coming out of the seed here. And what we do is um, the TZ test that turns the embryo pink that is destructive. So once you treat it with that chemical, the seed cannot be used for germination. So sometimes when you only have a very tiny percentage of seeds, that's a problem. So we use x-ray analysis, and this is a picture of x-rays and all of this white here that you see, that's the embryo. So x-ray analysis is a terrific way we can, um, uh, it's a system that we can use in the lab to know what we're starting with without killing the seeds. So this is an example of how we can put the seeds in four different temperatures at the same time. So if you were to just put these seeds outside during the fall or during the winter, um, you wouldn't be able to have all those treatments at the same time. And by doing it in the lab with simulated lights and temperatures, we can get a glimpse of what's happening with that seed in four seasons at the same time. So we put them in these chambers and we, we like to use what we call germination boxes. For us, this is much better than Petri dishes. We line them with this crepe paper so the seeds aren't directly sitting in water. And then we can remove the lids as we need to, to be able to count the germinants. So this is a picture of the nice white radical that's coming out of the seed. In this example, it's a seed of wild lime. So we get excited when we see that germination. And what I wanted to stress is that sometimes when we think of germination, we just think of the end result, like what percentage of the seeds you started with germinated. And what this picture shows is that there's actually other things to consider. And that is what we call germination speed or rate. So you can see these are four different temperatures that I'm showing you here by the different colors. And you can see that at, um, at one of the temperatures, the germination rate is much faster, the seeds germinate better than under the other temperatures. And sometimes this can be very useful and also can be uh, time saving in a nursery uh, condition. So we always look at speed. And the other thing we look at is uniformity. So if you have a, um, 
a cell tray of seeds and they're germinating over long periods over time, that space is costing a grower money. So anything that we can do in the lab to speed up that germination and to make it more uniform and quicker, um, the better. And, um, and we work with plant growth regulators to do that. And Stacy, if you want to stop me anytime for pertinent questions, then just jump in and do that. Otherwise, we'll, we'll take questions at the end. And um, for the audience, I am gonna send a, um, a PDF of these slides. So um, if you're not uh, getting some of the links that I provide, don't worry, you're gonna get that at the end. Okay, so I talked about what primary seed dormancy is, but what I didn't talk about is that there's, there's several different types. So um, seeds have three components. One of them is the seed coat. The other one is what we call the endosperm that's the, that provides the nutrition to the embryo. And then the third one is the embryo. And um, so seeds can have a dormancy that prevents water coming in through the seed coat. And uh, they can, and that's called physical dormancy, but they also can have a dormancy that's preventing the embryo from pushing through the seed coat and germinating. And that's called physiological dormancy. And seeds can also have what we call morphological dormancy. And that just has to do with the ratio of how much of the seed cavity does the embryo fill and how much is endosperm? So there's many different types of dormancy actually, but um, these are the three main categories. So to figure out if seeds have hard seed coats, um, what we do in the lab is we just will nick a set of seeds which will just um, use a razor blade or you can use sandpaper as well. And then we'll have a control where we don't treat the seeds. And then we just put them in water and we weigh the seeds over time, as you can see here. So these, um, this is the, these are wire weeds, both two species of wire weed. And you can see that, um, that both the nicked and the unnicked seeds were able to take up water, which made their fresh weight higher. But when you nick the seeds, they took up the water quicker, which makes sense because you're breaking that seed coat and allowing that embryo to imbibe. And um, so this is a great way you can do that. There's other ways that you can do that. Sometimes just visually, you can see if a seed swells, uh, a lot of the legumes, like, you, like just for example, when you're soaking beans, if you're making a 15 bean soup, some of the legumes will uh, swell visibly. And it's the same with, um, with wildflower seeds. You can see that imbibition. So we know that there's a number of families that typically have hard seed coats, the morning glory family, the hibiscus family, the, um, the legume family or pea family, um, a lot of the palms have hard seed coats. And so we use the sandpaper, like I, like I mentioned, or sometimes we'll use hot water where we'll pour boiling water over the seed and let it come to room temperature. In the lab, we'll use sulfuric acid, which is a harsher treatment. And, um, and then sometimes we'll use a rock tumbler. And um, what this shows is, this is Dahlia faei, and um, this is their germination under four different temperatures. And this shows in this column in the middle, it shows uh, how well they'll germinate if we acid scarify the seeds up to 68% germination. But look at this column to the right. These seeds only, we only achieve 3% germination if we didn't treat those seeds at all. 
So this kind of mimics what would happen naturally if a bird was to ingest a seed, it would go through its digestive tract and that would scarify the seeds. So we're trying to mimic that. And all of these systems work. Another term to mention is one called stratification. And all of that is, is just a period of time where you're providing this either moist, warm, or sometimes moist chilling conditions that satisfy, satisfies the dormancy in seeds. So sometimes it could be anywhere from one to eight weeks, or it could be from two to four months, depends on the species. And, um, and we know that naturally growth regulators are involved in um, helping to overcome the dormancy where a growth regulator called abscisid acid is decreased and a growth regulator called gibberellic acid is increased. And that can be a substitute that we can add to the germination, uh, the germination boxes to kind of fake the seeds into thinking they're receiving that stratification period. So plant growth regulators are very important in all aspects of plant propagation. So this, um, a lot of the different genera that do require stratification are the dogwoods, the summer hawthorns, the red buds, sassafras, and the uh, cayenanthus or the wild olives. So this was, this was an experiment that we did with a species called Vitellia farnesiana or sweet acacia. That's my graduate student to the left. And that shows this uh, tree in full bloom. It's a spectacular, just showstopper when it's flowering and it's very, the fragrance of the flowers is very profuse. And in this study, we wanted to see if there was a difference between using boiling water or sandpaper compared to not treating the seeds at all. So you can see we, um, we only had 22 days in this experiment, which is very fast, less than three weeks or just over three weeks. And uh, we were able to get equal germination from either method at the end of the study but very low germination if we did not treat those seeds. So that was, um, and these are all the different seed lengths that we, um, that we germinated here. And um, we're just publishing that study. So someone asked some time ago what some tips would be for successful seed germination. And I already mentioned the first one that we have to start from healthy stock plants um, and, and that we have to collect the fruit when the time is right. If the fruit does have, um, it, the, uh, if the fruit is fleshy, then you want to wash that off because that contains sugars. And then we just have to consider that some seeds are what we call orthodox and they can be stored for a long period of time. Other seeds are recalcitrant and they can't be stored for a long period of time. Um, a lot of that can be found in the literature. And, um, and the last one is um, just to observe what happens in nature. So sometimes we can learn a lot by just what happens in nature. When, what season do we see it begin to germinate? and under what conditions, and we can try to mimic that in the lab. Now, sometimes it's just not possible to propagate plants by seeds. Either the birds beat us to it, or they have a very narrow seed production time, or the seeds are very hard to get to germinate. And in these instances, we look for propagation by cuttings. We've done a lot of work in this area and, um, and cuttings really do have advantages because you can create more uniform plants quicker. They'll mature faster and flower faster. 
and um, and that will help to it will just help with your overall propagation schedule. Now there's a lot of different factors to consider with cutting propagation. And uh, the biggest one is that we have to mimic what the plants naturally synthesize themselves. So plants naturally synthesize a plant growth regulator called auxin. And we have to mimic that and treat them with that to get them to root. And um, so this is what one of my students is doing, trying to get that species to root. And this is a talc base that looks like baby powder oxen you can buy commercially. There's also a liquid based one. And there's different oxens that you can use. Some plants respond to one oxen better than the other. And then you have to consider what concentration of auxin you would want to use. So all of that is considered in our experimental design. And we, uh, these are all of our different treatments that we'll use for a single species. So this just gives you an idea of um, some results where we used a, a auxin called IBA and we used four different percentages. So the zero would be non-treating with ox, not treated with auxin. And, you know, we were still able to achieve 83% rooting without auxin, which is, which is considered commercially acceptable, but we could reach the, uh, a little over 95% rooting if we used a little bit of auxin. So that was really interesting information. This picture here shows two different substrates. Uh, sometimes we'll use a really light substrate where we'll combine perlite and vermiculite. And then sometimes we'll use the standard peat-based substrate that most nurseries will have on hand. After we determine whether or not the roots that whether or not roots will form on the plants, then we do what we call a rooting quality index, where a zero would be no roots, um, and then a one to four would be the level of roots the plants produce. Then we will measure the length of those roots because that is a factor into root quality. And then we will count the number of roots. And the whole reason we do all of this is because, for example, when you see this picture here at the bottom, the root number uh, or the rooting percentage is the same. Both of these cuttings rooted, but this is a much better quality cutting than the one on the left. And so we have to measure root quality when we do these tests. So these are my tips for successful stem cuttings uh, through the years. We do try to minimize um, cuttings that are bearing flowers because that's taking away um, from the from the plants being able to focus on rooting and um, and we do usually will strip the basal leaves and um, roots will form on that wound that you created and um, and then I, I know that a lot of the homeowners don't have mist systems like we have at the university but you could use a humidity dome or you can use your own mist mister that you just frequently a few times a day will mist your plants with just, and the whole idea is just to create maximum humidity to induce or encourage rooting. Knowing when to take the cuttings is also important. Some plants will root if you take them in the spring, others will root if you take them in the fall and others don't care when you take them. So micropropagation of wildflowers might seem like an extreme propagation measure to you because it's something most of us can't or aren't equipped to do at our homes. And also it's uh, micropropagation is just mass clonally producing plants. So, um, so you might think that that's not a good way to um, 
It's not a way to distribute plants because you're not capitalizing on that genetic diversity. But it, it actually is uh, becoming more and more popular. Our major AgriStarts agri micropropagation facility has a whole new line of natives that they're producing in tissue culture. And, um, and it's something that we consider in the lab and we want to look as an alternative because our goal is to figure out the, the every mechanism that we can find to propagate plants to get them into the industry. So, mop, so this is a picture of a student and she worked on the micro, micropropagation of Paranechia erecta or square flower. And the, um, we also have micropropagated the, um, the sweet acacia that I shared with you which you can see in this picture here, these are apical cuttings that are put in this media that contains all of the nutrients and, and, and sugar instead of carbon dioxide that a plant needs to survive. It's in tissue culture, so it's in a sterile environment and it has 100% humidity. And uh, we were able to successfully put uh, sweet acacia into micropropagation. And we we're also successfully able to put wild lime or xanthoxylum figuera into micropropagation. So in this study with one of my graduate students, she looked at seed propagation of the species, cutting propagation of the species, and also micropropagation. Now, um, I did just want to mention in this slide here that um, the different stages of micropropagation changes what plant growth regulators you will put in the media. So in stage two, when you're trying to multiply or make many plants, you have to put in a plant growth regulator that we call cytokinin. And in stage three, you would have to put in a different auxin called or, or a different hormone called auxin that you will be encouraging root initiation. So it's quite a process. Okay, so those are three primary propagation systems. Um, in the next few slides, I just wanted to touch on how important it is to consider the container you're choosing, the media, and also even your maintenance or your pruning of the plants. These are some examples of many different species we've grown in the greenhouse, one of my happy uh, students. And, um, and what, what we're trying to find is the best propagation media that will serve a suite of wildflowers and also the best containers because it's impossible to use a different media in a different container for every single species. So these are just pictures of the different wildflowers I discussed in one gallon pots. And we've done a lot of studies that have looked at all of the different container medias that you see on the left and how many, how many what types of media components are in them. And so this shows like the percentage of bark or the percentage of peat and how much they cost. So we have published um, all of these papers. And, um, you know, for some species like the dahlia that, that I showed you, uh, it doesn't matter which media you use. So you, would, you could choose the cheaper media or the media that you already have on hand. In other cases, it does matter. We spent a lot of research looking at, at um, using a renewable resource like compost uh, to replace peat. And, um, and this picture, we've had tremendous success. These are native flatwood and hammock species. And the picture, the container to the left is no compost. The container to the right is 100% compost. 
And you can just look at those pictures and see the plants responded favorably, having that extra organic matter. This is for these species, they liked that. And they grew much bigger. So sometimes we can use what's already available. And uh, we're continuing this project with the new native nursery that's at University of Florida campus. Uh, we're looking at three different wire, uh, three different native grasses and um, a different types of media for all of these grasses. You can look at this further in the slides that I'm gonna send you. And uh, stay tuned for these results. Over the years, we have spent a lot of time trying to figure out the best container. And I'm going to tell you what all of our research has shown. This is the container that you'll normally find at the box stores. It's the cheaper of, of the containers. I don't like it because it has smooth sides. It doesn't have big enough air, hole, air holes or water holes. And we love these ribbed they're ribbed cones. So they're cone shaped and the ribs prevent the circling of the roots and they have big holes at the bottom that air prune the roots. Even better than this, but more expensive and um, it may or may not be worth that expense is these root makers. And these root makers were designed where at each level um, of of a difference in the cell, like the cell kind of like goes in and then stops and then goes in and then stops. Um, that prevents the roots from circling. And in this picture here of our native, um, our Rebecca Herta, our one of our native, um, um, it's not cone flower, it's like an orange cone flower. It, you can see this is the ribbed cell and this is the root maker cell. Now these were a few more weeks older than this, but you can see what a beautiful root system you can achieve by using that system. This was an experiment we did on plant management. We trimmed this Coreopsis Leavenworthii to six inches, whereas this one we didn't trim at all. And look how much more flowering was initiated just by pruning. And the last part of our study, uh, I just wanted to include a, a, a picture is these variety trials. So we can do all of this wonderful research and figure out how to propagate the plants, but if they don't grow in our landscapes, if they don't like that modified soil um, or that container, then then they're going to fail and, um, and they're not going to meet market standards. So we trial everything and we look at the plants every month and we determine what performance they have and what their flowering is and publish that. All of this is published and presented at the website. Um, that's shown on the top there if you're interested in the intricacies of this research. And um, I just wanted to mention that there is a new Florida Friendly Bee Gardens app. If you're interested in bee gardening, then go to that app. It's free and you will learn all the different bee species and the plants they are attracted to. And there's also a new guide for uh, native plants that you can use as alternatives to invasive plants. And finally, I want to acknowledge the Florida Found Wildflower Foundation because uh, they funded some of our research. Um, all of the different faculty that have been working on different parts of this project and the many graduate students that have worked on this as well. So this is my uh, information. If you'd like to email me with questions or go to my website. And I'm going to leave you with a glimpse of the book I'm working on. And these are, this is gonna be one of my centerfold pages where I'm comparing the different uh, black-eyed Susans, uh, the different species in Florida side by side and um, and telling about how you can distinguish them 
and what features they have and uh, close ups of species like the wild petunia, um, what the seeds look like and what the cuttings look like. So that's just a glimpse of uh, what you can expect in the future. And that is all I have for today. So I'm looking forward to some questions. Uh, great, I'm just trying to get back here. Here we go. Thank you so much for that. That was a wonderful presentation. And um, I'm really um, excited to see your book and, and see what <laughs> it looks like a lot of good information um, starting from the seed and and um, helping us be successful in our own gardens. Um, we do have a few questions. Um, when you were talking about the um, tetrazolium, um, there's a question that said, what, when you do that test, do you use, also use statistical sampling based on the destructive nature of the test? And he says he's yeah. aware that there are sampling tests used in mechanical systems that have small productions, but testing is paramount. Yes, so, um, so we can do that in the lab or all of the seed testing labs. Uh, we can ship the seeds and, um, and they'll test it for us. So there's standard mm -hmm. procedures that they use um, for seeds and they're very accurate and reliable. And is there any, so is there any way that a home gardener can test viability of seed collected from their own garden or is that more of a, just take a chance? They can, um, you can order the tetrazolium online through Amazon. And um, if the seed's big enough, then you can see if it stains pink or not, but if the seed's small, you'll need the aid of a magnifying glass or a microscope, but absolutely. Can you discuss um, the drawbacks, if any, of cloning plants versus growing them from seed? Does that present any threats to the species genetics or gene pool if you're talking about cloning them to eventually get them to market? Yeah. So. It absolutely affects it. And for restoration species, um, clonally propagated plants aren't, um, aren't preferred. Um, I can tell you that the, the native nurseries like Green Isle Gardens, we work with a lot in Groveland, um, they actually, and also in micropropagation here in our labs, um, we work with, um, we'll collect the, plant material from many different plants, and then we'll maintain that genotype in culture. So then when we are releasing these species, it's act, it doesn't seem like, it seems like it's clonal and it is, but actually they're clones from many different genotypes of plants. And, but it would be impossible to know that unless you're buying from a reliable nursery. Great. Um, okay, another question. Some of the pictures showed the brown paper that you had the seeds germinating on. Is that ordinary craft paper, paper towel? Or that you, uh, you can use paper towels, but the, it's, it's called crepe paper. And um, we get it, if you email me, I'll send you the company. Um, we get it from a paper company and they, they, they sell bulk uh, filter paper and bulk paper, and they'll cut it to any size you want. And it's much cheaper than getting it from like a scientific company. Great. And uh, another question, and I had this question too, when did you prune the Coreopsis? At what, what time to get that response? Those were done for that species. I think those were done um, every every maybe maybe every three to four weeks something like that so we would do it let them grow do it again let them grow and um that was actually just a side project that my <laughs> technician did it actually but i it was very telling and i did want to mention with the with the germination um, with those boxes underneath that crepe paper the crepe paper, it, the brown crepe paper is very thin. Underneath that, what you didn't see 
is blotter paper. And that's a thick paper that absorbs water. So by doing that, uh, we were able to increase the humidity and we didn't have to add water to those um, germination boxes every day. All right. Um, so just talking about these underutilized natives, um, um, Debbie's asking, which one should we look to add to our landscapes that we haven't commonly used? And I know you mentioned some of them aren't readily available. Are there any that maybe we've overlooked that are available or, or is that not, um, or we, do we have to wait <laughs> until the research is complete? Right, so, so all of, I'm going back through my notes to look which ones. Um, so all of them are available from at least one nursery, <laughs> maybe <laughs> two nurseries. Um, depending on where you're located in Florida, you would want to go to that, you know, the native nursery that um, is one of the larger native nurseries. So for Green Isle Gardens, they sell about 315 different species of plants. They grow um, most of these, but for the panhandle species, you'll only find them available from panhandle native nurseries. Okay. Um, another question is um, a note that cuttings, uh, someone says cuttings that have been grown in water have roots that are weaker than those grown in soil. Is that generally true or does that vary by species? Or is uh, that not true at all? So most cuttings will not root in water. And with the exception, by the way, of Psychotria nervosa, which is a new discovery for me, the wild <laughs> coffee, which that's a whole nother project, but that will root in water in four months and it makes a great cup flower. But, um, but to answer your question, yes, uh, the, the roots need that substrate and it makes a better quality plant than if you're just, um, if you can get it to root in water even, um, the, the substrate, the, the roots need that contact with that substrate and that air exchange. Okay. Um, I have a couple questions about specific plants. Do you have any uh, tips on how to germinate our native pawpaw from seed? Oh, okay. <laughs> so I have not worked with the native pawpaw, but I've been to many, many different nurseries that do, and they seem to always, um, they seem to always uh, tell me that the depth of the cone is most important for pawpaw. So it has a very deep root structure. So you'll need to use cells that are much deeper or longer than the ones in the flats that I showed you. And patience, and patience. Those are the <laughs> things you need for pawpaw. If you're lucky enough to find seeds. Um, one last question, and um, I don't, this is uh, asking for tips on propagating woody shrubs like prunus or crotagus, cal calicanthus. Um, any recommendations on when to take cuttings or the preferred media to use? Yeah, so we have worked with a lot of um, woody cuttings, and um, it's a great question because woody cuttings are typically harder or not necessarily harder but they take longer to root you might have to usually the more woody a cutting the higher concentration of auxin you might use so like in these studies i only used up to 5,000 parts per million auxin but with with woody plants i might need to use as high as 16,000 parts per million wow. um, auxin and also the timing is very important. So for some woody plants, um, and I've worked with Critigus before and Cayenne, they're all hard, those are all hard and tricky ones. Um, but um, so the cutting maturity is, is important. And um, there's been lots of research on other woody plants that have collected cuttings from every season of the year. And sometimes there's just one month when uh, the maturity is perfect and the combination of hormones is, is um, optimal. 
and the and they'll root. So sometimes um, bottom heat helps a lot if it's during the cooler months for sure. Um, bottom heat always helps and um, cutting maturity and also a higher auxin concentration. Those are the three primary things that when we're working with, we call that recalcitrant species that are hard to root. Mm -hmm. Okay, and last but not least, and not to put you on the spot, but we're getting a lot of comments excited for your book. Um, oh. when, when can we expect it? Um, what, what can you tell our audience? Oh, well, that? first of all, I, I just have to say, I'm really, really excited about all of your wonderful questions. And it shows just not only how interested you are, but how smart you are and um, that you want to learn more and about propagation. And to answer that question, we are not, we haven't entered a contract yet, but, um, but we're getting closer. And I, I spend one hour every week um, with my co-author on this. And his job is to keep me on task. And we assign each other tasks every week. So, um, we're we're thinking it's probably going to be about a hundred different species, and mm -hmm. it's going to include our our research, our evidence based data on um, it on how a homeowner can propagate the plant by seed, and also by um, cuttings or micropropagation, and also a commercial grower as well. That's wonderful. Well, I trust you'll let us know when it's ready so that we can share it with, with everyone. Yes, else. and you can invite me back. And let's hope I don't have gray hair when you invite <laughs> me back. <laughs> well, thank you so much for your time today. Um, and just as a reminder to everyone, um, Dr. Wilson will be sharing her slide deck with us. We will include a link to that as well as the links that she referenced in the um, presentation and a link to the recording in a follow-up email that we'll send to you in the next day or so. So keep an eye out for that. If you do have additional questions, uh, you're welcome to send them to us and we'll make sure that Dr. Wilson gets them. And um, hope you guys will join us next month for our presentation on native bees. Thank you, Sandy. You're welcome. Bye-bye.